Hello everyone and welcome to Christian Emotional Recovery, the YouTube channel. I'm your host, Rachel Leroy, and today I'm doing part two of a series on how trauma impacts chronic illness. The first part was part one, and if you have not listened to part one, I encourage you before you listen to this one to go back and listen to how trauma impacts chronic illness part one and this is part two part one discussed the actual connections between trauma especially childhood trauma and chronic illness and in this episode we're going to talk more about healing what you can do for yourself how you can advocate for yourself and the process that you can go through in order to decrease that impact in order to heal the impacts that have already occurred in order to advocate for yourself if you experience chronic illness particularly connected to trauma so um, I've got three articles here that I wanted to go into, but first, if you haven't, click on the subscribe bell and subscribe to the YouTube channel where you can get material that you cannot get anywhere else. It's exclusive to YouTube for the most part. I do have a few crossover episodes. And you'll get a notification for every time a new video comes out, which is generally during season, the season that we're in um, every two weeks. So this is part two. The other vi video was put out two weeks ago. If you're listening to this after the fact, then like I said, go back and check out part one of this series and I'll link it into the, um, I'll link it into the video so you can go there and then you can come back and listen to this because it'll make a lot more sense to do them in order. Okay. So, um, a little bit about chronic illness. There is a link that is established that's very strong between trauma childhood trauma and ACES, which is a study that was done that's very reputable where you can take a test and it's adverse childhood experiences and it's based on a specific list of um, different types of things like psychological abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional neglect, physical neglect, adverse issues in the home like drug abuse and incarceration and um, chaos and things like that. So um, you have this score and the higher the score is, the more it impacts your likelihood to have specific chronic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes and so forth and so on. But um, you know, that can make people panic and freak out and be like, well, that's not fair and that sucks. And those are all understandable responses. I feel the same way. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about my own experience because um, I have, um, by the way, I'm doing a voiceover and I'm using articles to... Um, show you the impacts. Sometimes I create my own visuals, but I don't really have a lot of time to do that right now. So I'm crediting these articles. They're in the show notes. For example, this one is by Veronique Mead, and there's tips for healing chronic illnesses. And there's two other articles, and I'll get into those in just a little bit. So we can talk about um, ways that you can heal chronic illness with trauma in mind, ways that you can start to disconnect the connection between those by severing the source of the trauma and healing it, and ways that you can advocate for yourself if you are a trauma survivor and especially a trauma survivor with chronic illness. Now, I've dealt with health issues my whole life. I've talked about them a little bit on the podcast and the YouTube channel. And maybe sometime I will talk more in detail about all the things that I've been through. And it slows down what I can do with the podcast. And it slows down what I can do with my work and trying to start a business. I've been trying and it's not been working out. But I'm going to keep trying and I'm going to keep working on it. And I hope that God will bless me and help me with that. And that's one reason why your support is so appreciated and so needed to keep this work going and to allow me to be able to continue to expand the podcast and the pot platform. But some of the things that I've been dealt with are um, hereditary. Some of them are neurological. Some of them are autoimmune. Some of them are hormonal. Some of them are mood conditions and disorders that most of us have like depression anxiety other people deal with things like bipolar disorder and um um ocd um you know um 
hyperactivity disorder and attention deficit disorder and things like that. Those are things that a lot of us deal with. Some of us are neurodivergent. Some of us have conditions that are sort of crossed over between those different areas of physical and mental health in the brain. And so there's a lot of things that stress and chronic stress and um, anxiety and chronic illness. There's all a connection there. So what do we do about that? We've talked about in the last episode what the impacts are. Very briefly, it's, you know, we could go on and on, but I'm just trying to keep this a little brief. But how can you advocate for yourself? What can you do for yourself? So first of all, there's 22 encouraging tips for healing chronic illness. This is a really good article. And this lady talks about remodeling her um, one of her rooms as sort of a metaphor for how the nature of dealing with chronic illness that is brought on by trauma and how do you make it better? How do you work on healing yourself? So there are some tips here that can help you be realistic about it, that can help you have a good attitude even though it's kind of sucks and kind of isn't fair. And how to, you know, even make it into something that, I don't want to say can be a gift, it's just kind of icky to say that, but something where you can take that experience and turn it into something almost like alchemy, where you turn it into something beautiful. In other words, it makes you a better person, it makes you more compassionate, it makes you more aware, it makes you advocate for other people that are just coming up through the experiences you've already been through that are similar. Not the same, but similar. And she says, start with your vision, your dream of something better. First, you have to believe you can um, make progress in this area. She says, try, test, and experiment. So when you're trying to heal, and that's emotionally and physically, it may take some tests of medications, of devices, of different doctors, of different tests, of different procedures to see what works. And you may have to even do that within a limited budget. I completely understand that limitation, believe me. Now with chronic illness, you explore impulses. If they resonate, trust and try. Impulses here, we're not talking about like, oh, I wanna eat five gallons of chocolate ice cream. It's more like if you have an instinct that something could help you or work and it doesn't make any sense, I wouldn't just completely trust it, but Test the waters. Stick your feet in the water and test it a little bit and see if it might be something that you need to listen to. It could be God telling you something that could help you heal. God gives us clues. He also talks to us through our bodies. Listen to your body. Also, when you're looking for treatment or a plan or anything like that, find the best fit. Enjoy signs of progress. Those are milestones. Three steps forward and two steps back is the nature of this. So you may take three steps forward, celebrate that. And then when you take two steps back, be like, it's okay. I'm moving forward overall. So a lot of it is your attitude. Attitude does come into it some. Notice the sun when it starts to come in. So if things get better, if you start feeling better, really be thankful for that. Give praise to God for that and enjoy that. Revel in that. Um, trauma work can be hard and messy and that's normal. So that's another thing to think about. It's not normal for there to be a straight line. It's more like you've seen the thing about progress where it's like, <laughs> like a squiggly line moving in all these directions, but it generally moves forward. It's not linear. It can be messy. Like I said, it can be three steps forward and two steps back and then two steps forward and one more step forward and then another step back and then so on. But it, it can be messy, and that's okay. Keep calm and strengthen your inner observer. Reap the rewards. Enjoy the work you've done when you get make progress. Other areas of our lives are affected by this. Relationships, finances, that sucks. My finances are greatly affected by my health. If I could work full-time all the time, I wouldn't struggle financially. I'd be okay in that area. I'm okay now, but it's not where I want to be. Does that make sense? So invite resources and support for your journey. You've got to have a support system. People, doctors, therapists, coaches, friends, family, animals, anything. It can even be things to help you on the journey. Make room for self-care. Make room for self-care. You've got to be able to take the time to take care of yourself. Say no and set boundaries and do what you can do. 
if you can't do what other people are able to do, that's okay. You're not them. You don't compare yourself to them. Chaos happens. I think that's kind of like the other one where we were talking about it's messy. Um, and that's part of the process too. That's okay, especially if you're rearranging things. You're trying to figure out a new pattern for your health. It can be scary to make those changes and it can get messy and sometimes get worse before it gets better. So you just have to kind of Except that there'll be times where there's chaos, and that's part of the process, and that's okay. Pfft, I hate chaos, but yeah, the, the, you, you, you see what I'm saying. Inspire yourself with the little things. Those little things in life add up. They can help make life better. It might be enjoying a cookie in the morning. It might be petting your dog for a couple of minutes when you work in the afternoon and taking a little break and drinking some hot tea, taking a stretch and getting back to work. There are layers to healing. You've heard the metaphor of peeling back the onion and there's another layer. That's how the healing work happens. That's also how um, dealing with a chronic illness. You deal with a little bit at a time and it gets better and better and better. Healing trauma creates more space. The outside and the inside both change. So it's a holistic process. It's your body, your mind, your soul, all of it. Oftentimes we need help when healing trauma, she says. So, you know, like it said, there's times where you can't do everything on your own. And if you're able to get that support professionally, do it. Do it. Okay? Trauma therapy gives us skills that we can take with us and use every day beyond just the basic healing process. Per persevere. Don't give up. Discouragement happens. There are going to be times where you have a setback, maybe even a major setback. And that's normal. We're human, she says. And that's true. It, um... For example, I have had my neck issues with my neck and it affects my um, vagal nerve and it affect, causes all these symptoms and I've had shooting nerve pain, which is absolutely terrifying. And I was um, getting back, I went to physical therapy, I went to see um, a special chiropractor that works on the atlas, which is that top bone up in the top of your head that kind of leads the rest of the... Basically, what happened was I got back in alignment and I got better for a few months and then I had a major blowout and some of this stuff returned and now I've been having all these symptoms for like five weeks that I've been slowly getting better by experimenting and finding new things and using some of the old things that work for me. Um, so you, you will get discouraged. You will have setbacks, but you cannot give up. Three steps forward and two steps back, but you're still moving forward. And then it makes a difference. Um, the lady that wrote this, her health is still improving. So she's talking about her own journey, but I think it's helpful to see other people's experiences to know that you can get better and that it is possible and that healing is possible. To connect with other people that are going through this journey is absolutely invaluable. It's absolutely invaluable. So just a couple of ones that I wanted to look at here. Number one, especially, was start with your vision. So you have to start somewhere. And um, when seeking to reduce symptoms of chronic illness, we start with a belief that healing at any level is possible. You've got to believe it's possible. Since chronic illness is incurable by its very definition, this often means we have to forge our own paths, sometimes against our doctor's beliefs. I'm not telling you to do anything against your doctor's beliefs, but you know you've got to be your own healthcare advocate. So um, take that with a grain of salt. But yeah. And then the next one I wanted to really look at was number six, which was notice the sun when it starts to come in. So when things do get better, when you're starting to reap the rewards of your hard work, um, when you heal chronic illness by addressing trauma-based patterns in the nervous system and throughout our bodies, it takes time. It can take longer than you think it's going to, but when you see progress, even a little bit, celebrate it, enjoy it, emphasize it and appreciate it and then seven like i said it can be messy and i think it kind of kind of goes with the part about there can be chaos um so we don't have to address every single little trauma we've ever experienced she says and that's true in order to begin to heal reaching a tipping point is all the body seems to need for its innate ability to recover to emerge that's true too there's still a lot of dirt to look up um when we're working with trauma as a significant um as symptoms as significant as chronic illness so you can't skip over the messy bits you got to clean up the mess it sucks you didn't make the mess but there it is and so that's part of the healing process going through the pain the grief the loss the fear and doing a little bit at a time doing it in a safe space doing it with boundaries doing it contained and healthy in a balanced way 
And then another one here that stood out to me was number 12. Um, number 12, make room for self-care. I can't emphasize this enough. Self-care involves things, she says, like saying no when we don't want to say yes, getting enough sleep, eating in ways that feel good, meditating, doing yoga or stretching if you don't do yoga, having lunch with friends, working out and exercising in gentle ways. Maybe you can do vigorous exercise, maybe you can't. That's another thing you need to test yourself and talk to your doctor. But do things that make you feel good, that are healthy, that are not sinful, that are good for you. Not overspending your spoons. If you know what the spoon theory is, is um, if you have chronic illness or mental health issues, you have a certain number of spoons every day you can spend. That's how you spend your mental and physical energy. And you may have fewer than the average person. And once they're gone, they're gone. So be very careful with your spoons. Don't be scared to spend them if you need to, but be... Um, discreet in how you spend them, if that makes sense. 19 was the last one I wanted to look at. And that one is trauma therapy gives us skills we can take with us and use every day. Whether you're working with a therapist or you're doing your own healing, somatic body work or mind work. It says... It says you won't always need a trauma therapist and you won't always need to work as intensely as often or with another's help. So it, there does come a time where you hit a tipping point and it gets a little easier. You always need to do the healing work, but maybe not as much. And you have fewer chronic conditions and symptoms. It says healing affects of trauma teach you many skills that you can carry forever. Mindfulness becomes as much a part of you as breathing. You learn to recognize triggers and begin to anticipate flares, prepare for them, figure out how to recover when they happen or even prevent them. I've been able to notice things in my body and be like, whoa, I've got to slow down for a couple of days or I'm going to sleep a long time tonight or I need to start taking that supplement again or I need to cut caffeine for a few weeks. Those cues if you know them, once you know them, listen to them and trust them and follow through on whatever it is. And it says your witness helps you understand events that might otherwise be stressful. So it's about mindful observing. You gain more capacity to resource and regulate your reactions. Healing trauma isn't just hard work and moving through the layers. It's also an investment that keeps on giving in the best possible way. And that is so true. And so a little bit about that's things that you can do to help you to heal chronic illness and heal trauma with chronic illness in mind. And there's another article here called Creative Arts Therapy Source. And it talks about how to heal trauma, um, how to heal when you have childhood trauma related to your chronic illness. And I'm just going to read, this talks about the ACEs scores. We've already gone through that in the last video, part one of this. So let's talk about how to heal when you have childhood trauma. And it talks about things you can do to help you heal are one, you can educate yourself. And so know the connection between trauma, ACEs scores, and chronic illness. Learn about your chronic illness. But let me tell you something. When I was going through some of my worst symptoms, I had some serious flare-ups where I was basically in the bed most of the day. I could get up for a few hours for a couple of months at a time, and I would slowly get better as my body homeostasis kicked in. Whatever the flare-up was from, I still don't have a diagnosis, but it would slowly start to regulate. But I would start reading about all this stuff based on my symptoms and being paranoid that I had all these terrible conditions. So you need to educate yourself, but please, for the love of all that is good and holy, do not get on WebMD and obsess and think that you have these terrible diseases. You will actually make your chronic stress worse. So educate yourself, learn a little bit at a time, but don't obsess over it and don't start going down those rabbit holes. Do not do it. Walk away. I don't care what you have to do. Do not do it. Don't go down those paranoid rabbit holes. Okay? Tell me you're not going to do that right now. Okay? It is bad news. I went there and it was terrifying. And I would shake and I would cry and I would just think, oh, I have this terrible disease and my life is over and I don't even know how I'm going to tolerate this. And nine times out of ten, it doesn't turn out quite as bad as that. And you still take it one step at a time no matter what. Take care of yourself as number two here through this process. And some ways you can do that in self-care, mindfulness and meditation, healthy eating. So it's about lifestyle choices, not just 
the mind stuff, not just the body stuff when it comes to healing trauma. You're a whole person, a holistic approach. They're doing so much research now showing that Chinese and Indian medicine was right to begin with. They don't believe in the body and the mind as separate things like Western medicine. They believe that the body and mind are one thing and they're inseparable. And I agree with that. And I think that that's wise. And there's science backing that up more and more every day. So healthy eating impacts your chronic illnesses. And your uh, mind, if it affects your body, then your body also affects your mind. It goes both ways. It's a cycle. Regular sleep patterns, stress management, quality social time, daily exercise and physical activity, even if it's just going for a 10-minute walk, even if you can only walk to your mailbox, even if you just sit outside and listen to the birds for a half an hour a day, anything helps. So don't feel bad if you're not going to the gym and sweating for an hour a day. You don't need to do that to be healthy. You take a 15-minute walk every day, you're increasing your health in so many ways. You're getting sunshine, and you're getting hearing the birds sing, and your change of environment, and you're moving, and you're getting fresh air. And there's just so many benefits, you can't even begin to understand how many there are because it's so subtle. Um, Hobbies and interests, relaxation techniques. While you don't want to disassociate with addictions, having things that keep your mind occupied in a healthy way, there's a time you need to tune in with yourself. But there's also a time to stay busy. And if you're not able to work because maybe your chronic conditions are that cumbersome, if there are simple hobbies that you can do, even watching a movie, something to keep your mind occupied can be healthy. Keep a journal is number three. Um, You can keep track of your triggers and responses, what you've learned, solutions. So that will help you to understand when you start to have a flare or the progress that you've made so you can see that progress. So you understand your body. Also, keeping a journal with your emotional stuff and, and doing journal prompts that help you heal trauma. There's free ones all over the internet. Those are all helpful. Um, learn, lean on your support system. You have God. Not all of us have a great family and friend support system, but find the support system you can, whether it's a therapist, a coach, your pet. It might be nature. It might be God. It might be an online healing group. So there's a lot of free support groups out there as well. You might join a support group like Celebrate Recovery, um, ACOA, um, Adult Children of Alcoholics. You don't have to be a child of an alcoholic to still get help because it's the same healing process, okay? And therapy is another one. Art, music, and just listening to music. If you aren't able to do a lot of like physical stuff, like play the trumpet or play the flute or play the piano or the guitar, if you can't do stuff like that, then you could listen to music. You could sing if you're able to sing. There's a lot of things you can do. Dance if you're physically able to dance. Um, do art. There's a lot of strong studies and there's programs where people heal their trauma through these expressive ways because you can get parts of your soul and your mind and your experience out in a way that you can't through words and through therapy and all that. And the last part of this whole puzzle is you've got to be your own health advocate. This is absolutely related to trauma and how it affects chronic illness because there are so many doctors out there that won't believe you. They'll tell you what's all in your head. They'll um, invalidate your symptoms. And you've got to find a doctor who will listen to you. You've got to find a doctor or a healthcare advocate who believes you. You've got to find one who's willing to try unconventional methods. And you've got to find one that is trauma-informed, at least on a basic level. And so that's hard. I know it's hard. But being your own healthcare advocate, this is in WebMD. This is by Susan Bernstein. And it just talks about what is a health advocate. And they take control of their healthcare experience. You and your doctors make decisions as a team. You speak up with your questions, needs, and concerns. If you feel like, oh, well, I'm being aggravating or I'm being annoying or I'm asking for too much, you need to be, of course, be reasonable, but you need to speak up. If you have questions, needs, or concerns, or preferences, tell your doctor. 
And if you try unconventional health care methods, just be careful with those. But if that's what, like, there were times when conventional medicine didn't help me. And so I saw a cranial sacral um, massage therapist. I've seen one of those. I've seen an atlas orthogonal chiropractor, which is kind of cutting edge. It's science-based, but it's not very well known. And I've seen a lot of specialists and holistic practitioners, and sometimes they've helped me better than doctors. Now, I'm not saying don't use science, medicine, and doctors. You need to see a doctor if you have a health condition. But it can be hard to find a doctor, so just keep looking and advocate for yourself. Build a doctor-patient relationship. Be open and honest with your doctor. Um, Be honest about your symptoms, your prescriptions, your medical records, your family history, your drug allergies, and over-the-counter medicines and all the stuff you're taking. Do your health homework. Like I said, study your research conditions, symptoms, but don't go down a rabbit hole. Ask questions. If you don't understand something, um, your diagnosis, your treatment options, anything that your doctor suggests, ask them for an explanation in a clear, simple way. Um, You might ask them, it lists some, I won't go into those, but your treatment options, tests, risks, side effects, success rates, medical terms, and so on. Um, if they suggest certain treatments, ask about the cost, the coverage, the pharmacies, or whatever the case may be, and talk to your doctor. Even if this is a holistic person, you would still do a lot of these things. For example, introduce yourself to your doctor or nurse or your practitioner and let them know what your name or nickname is you prefer. You would do this with a therapist as well. Ask for help in your native language if your doctor's office has an interpreter. Okay, that's make eye contact when you talk let doctors know if you have any hearing or vision problems listen while they explain your diagnosis and then ask the questions and ask how to contact your doctor's office with questions insurance matters medicine refills and to schedule follow-ups so even though these are practical suggestions you need to be your own healthcare advocate and there are times when your doctor will not have an answer that will be frustrating and scary they've done everything they can but you are not that does not mean you've exhausted all of your options it might need you might need to see a specialist in another area you might need to see a different therapist you might need to consider some holistic options And do those carefully and do those with the advice of a licensed medical professional, okay? That's not a substitute for going to see a doctor. But I do understand the frustration of finding a good doctor. I understand the frustration of having a chronic illness you cannot diagnose. I have one and it's not been diagnosed. And I understand the conditions that can cause you to be laid up in the bed for days, weeks, or months, or parts of days every day. And so please know that you're not alone in this. Know that you can be your own advocate and that it's okay to speak up. Know that it's okay to set boundaries and take care of yourself. And know that you can love other people. And if you have good people in your life, they will understand if you're doing your best. And you can also take these experiences and help other people who are going through similar things and support them as well. This isn't just about what we can do for ourselves. It's about what we can do to take this experience into the world. Once we learn more about our conditions, once we are able to manage our conditions, then we're able to help other people in similar situations. And that's such a blessing. It's such a blessing. That's what I'm trying to do here. And so this whole talk is about um, the connection between trauma and chronic illness and how you can help yourself. That's what part two of this talk is about. And I hope that this has helped you and given you some specific guidelines, suggestions, and tactics, strategies to help you do that. Thank you so much for listening. This is part two of a two-part series, and um, this is a YouTube video. And um, thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Remember, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and God loves you.